All right. Well, thank you very much for. Uh, well, I would like to join the other speakers in thanking the organizers for uh, their hard work that everybody in Orange Short and uh, um, uh, the organizers, the scientific board and advisory board did for putting this meeting together. This is actually my first time at the Poisson meeting and I'm enjoying it tremendously. So today I'll report on several, uh, on actually a whole line of work which uh, carries the name of your Linda formula and I think this is very appropriate because this formula was discovered here in Utrecht um, but this uh, for me will be just an application of a much more general line and a bit much bigger question that I'll try to challenge um, during this talk. So during the formula will simply be a very concrete application and in this spirit I like the question that Alan Weinstein uh, mentioned during his talk whether it's worth our time. So I'll basically try to see whether current framework or our understanding is uh, sufficient enough by trying to apply it to, to this particular problem that I'm going to describe to you. Also, uh, of course, we had lots of great talks today and this has been a long day, so I'm the last speaker before the reception, so I'll try to provide you a little bit of entertainment with the help of the computer as well. So, first, um, I was reminded last week that there is a great quote from physicist Steven Weinberg who said that our problem is not that we take our theories too seriously, but rather that we don't take them seriously enough. So there is one great theory which we have called quantum mechanics, and I don't think I have to explain much that quantum mechanics obviously works. Everything we use in our life from cell phones to nanotechnology or anything else is powered by quantum mechanics so it's definitely a good theory but we don't have good mathematical framework for this theory and of course this is big motivation for many of us uh, here at this meeting so just to emphasize how poorly we understand it here are a couple of quotes from uh, great physicists fathers of the subject. So Richard Feynman said, I think I can safely say that nobody understands quantum mechanics. And then Niels Bohr, another father of the subject, says, anyone who is not shocked by quantum mechanics has not understood a single word. Then it becomes even more interesting. So, very interesting theory. Makes no sense at all. <laughs> And there are a couple of quotes from Albert Einstein. Uh, there are many more that our fathers said in the same spirit. Uh, so, therefore, motivation for a bigger question then, and I think it's good to keep in mind that I'd like to, to emphasize is understanding of mathematical structure of quantum mechanics. So, of course, the theory goes back to, to this fathers which observed the following and that's, that's the reason we talk about it in the language of symplectic geometry. Starting with the work of Hamilton and Lagrange uh, we can formulate classical systems, classical mechanics, classical dynamical systems in a phase space which besides coordinates contains the momenta, derivatives of coordinates, so this space obviously is of double dimension compared to the set, um, set of all possible coordinates you can have. And for example, in the case of a familiar harmonic oscillator, you see that motion of the oscillator which goes back and forth in the phase space is described by a nice circular motion on a submanifold uh, in this X and P space, which in the present case is simply a circle. So that submanifold, of, of course, is Lagrangian, and if you wish, it characterizes classical state of the system. System, but what the fathers of this subject observed is that it plays an important role even in the quantum system. For example, in the basic example here, the energy, the formula for the energy levels is naturally obtained by thinking about integral of the symplectic form contained within the circle, bounded by the circle, and they basically postulated that a system should have one state per unit 
area or more generally volume of the phase space of the symplectic manifold M uh, which consists of coordinates and momentum. So this is what these days we call more Sommerfeld quantization condition, usually it's phrased a little bit differently, uh, but this is the origin of discreteness that quantum mechanics is intrinsically associated with compared to nice smooth continuous things that we see in classical mechanics. So in the previous example of a harmonic oscillator, the system was bounded or confined to a finite region or compact interior of the phase space by potential energy on the Hamiltonian, which didn't allow coordinate x or momentum p to become very large. Well, we can consider some other systems where the phase space is compact from the start. For example, a two-sphere is a good example. It's a nice symplectic manifold and it could naturally play the role of a phase space with completely zero Hamiltonian where there is no potential, uh, no Hamiltonian whatsoever. Well, in high school we learn about non-degenerate volume form on a two-sphere in terms of spherical coordinates. Once we get to graduate school and algebraic geometry, we prefer to describe varieties by algebraic equations. So this is equation for the sphere and Cartesian coordinates. And then typically the way we encounter the volume form in this case would be dx which dy over z. In course of algebraic geometry, we usually encounter such expressions where x, y, and z are complex variables, but it works just as well for the real slice. Uh, for real values of x, y, and z. Either way, uh, by analogy with what Bohr and Sommerfeld told us, we would expect that quantization of this problem of this sim uh, symplectic manifold should give a finite dimensional Hilbert space because phase space is compact and roughly speaking dimension of the Hilbert space should be equal to the area or integral of the symplectic form over uh, this two sphere and a symplectic form is normalized with one over h bar in front, which is usual convention. We see that dimension is equal to one over h bar. So one thing we immediately learn from this basic example is that not all symplectic manifolds should be quantizable. That in some instances, only discrete set of symplectic structures may actually make sense for the quantization problem. And we'll see much more detailed and refined versions of the statement and close cousins of it which have nothing to do with bohr sommerfeld but express much more delicate conditions. However, even in this basic problem we see that h bohr or inverse of it has to be discrete, namely take integer values for the dimension to be integer, otherwise uh, what are we talking about? So, therefore, the problem which motivates this particular talk, and that I want to keep in mind, even though, as I say later, I'll focus on particular applications, is the problem of quantization, which is essentially the problem of quantization of symplectic geometry, if you wish. So, it turns classical gadgets and symplectic geometry and turns them into various more algebraic objects of algebraic nature. So, starting with the symplectic manifold in physics one wants to get the Hilbert space out, just like in our baby examples, then algebra of functions on the manifold is replaced by algebra of operators, which then acts on the Hilbert space. Well, in our case of harmonic oscillator, we saw that states of a classical system are described by Lagrangian submanifolds. That was, for example, a circle in the two-dimensional phase space, and then becomes a vector in the Hilbert space or a state in the Hilbert space. Then there are lots of additional items I could put on this list, which converts classical objects on the left into quantum objects on the right, and this is, if you wish, a wish list of uh, what quantization should do for us. We don't have a complete solution to this problem, and of course that's why we are here, in part for many of us this is the motivation, and I'll try to uh, challenge some of the existing frameworks in the context of this problem. However, before I proceed, I want to emphasize that there is a completely different field of mathematics, which often doesn't talk to people working on Poisson geometry in physics or mathematics, and that field is called mirror symmetry. And it starts from exactly the same starting point. It starts from, from the data of a symplectic manifold. The goal of mirror symmetry, in fact, is to relate symplectic geometry of one space to complex geometry or algebraic geometry of some other space. Well, since I'm interested more in symplectic aspects, I'll focus on this side of the mirror symmetry correspondence. And then 
practitioners working in that area associate lots of fancy gadgets to the data of a symplectic manifold. Gromov-Witten invariants, so-called Fukai category, quantum cohomology. I emphasize that some of them even carry the word quantum in the name. So could it be that the answer to this quantization problem on the previous page is already contained in some of the fancy gadgets that we see in uh, context of mirror symmetry? That people develop lots of tools, could they be helpful to us? So. Of course, the answer to this question is yes, otherwise I would not have started with this. And the answer is actually yes, but it's a little bit surprising. So, in particular, it will involve some of these gadgets associated to slightly different symplectic manifold, not exactly the phase space M itself, but something else. That's why carefully I call it Y here, to distinguish from M. Now, before I proceed further, I should also mention that there are several standard tools which allow us to address this quantization problem, at least to some extent, and the powers are quite complementary, so they complement each other very nicely. One is called geometric quantization, and it goes as follows. Its first starting point is construction of pre-quantum line bundle, whose curvature is exactly, or the, um, yeah, whose curvature is exactly the uh, symplectic form omega. So then at the second stage, and, and this first stage I should emphasize is probably very typical to more or less any approach to quantization. The second choice tries to write chores on our symplectic manifold as cotangent bundles to various sets, which I call U, and glue them together then by knowing how to quantize contingent bundle, one tries to basically build quantization of the entire space M. And this is the difficult step because it is this choice, called choice of polarization, uh, which usually um, don'ts this, this whole construction in the sense that in the end one has to prove that construction is independent of such choice, it's sometimes difficult to glue the charts, and so on and so forth. So, you're allowed along the way to make additional choices besides just the data of a symplectic manifold which was given to us, but in the end we're supposed to prove that if somebody else makes a different choice on Mars or elsewhere, their answer is going to be related to ours by some canonical procedure, some canonical transformation. And that's not easy, so that's, that's where uh, this step turns out to be quite difficult. Although in cases where it works, it gives both the Hilbert space and the algebra A, which quantizes the algebra of functions. So another very powerful method which should be mentioned is deformation quantization, and it constructs so-called store product or deformed product in the algebra of functions. So it aims to construct the algebra and does it beautifully because it requires no auxiliary choices. So this is very systematic, it has minimum extra input information, I mean auxiliary uh, information not supplied with the problem, but it unfortunately is aimed to produce the algebra. So the analysis that goes into this systematic method which based on beautiful combinatorics of graphs and so on, constructs the algebra where parameter h bar, this deformation parameter, is just a formal parameter. In particular, that's why it's very hard or generally not easy to detect that h bar has to be integral, like in our baby example of a two-sphere, for instance. So, in fact, if you apply it to this example of a two-sphere, you would find that quantization of functions x and y obey this uh, bracket, which is the familiar bracket in the SU2 Lie algebra, but detecting that something special would happen for um, inverse integer values of H bar is not going to be simple, especially if you want to generalize this to more uh, to bigger context. So this is the kind of problem I want to um, address. I hope I motivated enough what we want to study, and I want to consider it in a set of non-trivial examples that show basically push the existing methods of quantization or the ways to solve the quantization problem to their fullest, to the boundary of what they can do. 
I'll give you two sets of examples which are of independent interests in different areas of mathematics and both of these examples will be based on groups in one way or the other. So throughout this whole talk G is a compact Lie group which for simplicity I'll take to be simple. So keep SU2 in mind as, as an example. So then first class of examples will come from topology and will combine information about group theory with topology. So let's pick a Riemann surface of genus G, I'll call this Riemann surface C, and consider a G bundle over this Riemann surface. Then if A is a connection on this G bundle, it's natural to look, and this comes from many different applications, at the moduli space of solutions to the flatness equations, dA plus A by J equals zero. So this moduli space turns out to be a nice symplectic manifold. And therefore we have already a good supply just from topology, namely starting with the date of a Riemann surface, choice of G, group capital G, uh, we get big supply of symplectic manifolds. And if there are symplectic manifolds, natural question is, what, what is their quantization? So that's kind of question we'll think about. And um, I hear that Anton Alexeyev already gave you a set of beautiful lectures last week uh, with introduction to the subject, so I'll only review it very briefly. I want to emphasize that this manifold moduli space of flat connections, M, which I call M flat GC, um, is not something terribly abstract and complicated as it may seem from uh, the way I presented it. You don't always have to solve these differential equations and it doesn't involve details of the analysis because in the present case all flat connections can be characterized by their holonomies. So holonomies are equivalently homomorphisms from the fundamental group into the group G of your choice and if you have a presentation of the fundamental group of the Riemann surface in terms of generators which obey this standard single relation then all you have to do is to write the same equation where instead of generators A1, B1 and so on up to A, G, B, G you replace them by G valued matrices so for example if you work with SU2 this would be SU2 matrices and then uh, this variety defined by this matrix equation where a product of all this holonomies is identity is exactly the moduli space we are after so it's very concrete it's basically algebra uh, over matrices in particular, this way of looking at the manifold M in the present class of examples can quickly tell us what the dimension of this space should be. So this is just a small exercise, let's do it together to get in the habit of using this description of the moduli space. Well, we see that if we're working with the group G, then elements, this holonomy is AI and BJ, uh, or each matrix of dimension which is equal to dimension of the group so they contain uh, twice genus times dimension of the group real entries and we impose one matrix equation for this guy so we should subtract dimension of the group for number of equations and usually in such context we also want to consider solutions modular conjugation or what physicists would call gauge transformations so we should also divide by G by the group which means that look at all this uh, possible values of AIBJ modular simultaneous conjugation of AIBJ by the same group element so that subtracts another copy of dimension of the group from the dimension and we obtain the total space of solutions to this to be twice genus minus one times dimension of the group. This assumes that uh, genus is bigger than one. And with some additional assumptions which I won't bother with coming from topology but one can easily achieve it, this moduli space is smooth and compact. It's not always the case but uh, it's easy to achieve and I'll assume that that's the case for us. Uh, an example, concrete example to keep in mind is where a group is SU2 and genus is equal to 2. For example, this is exactly the Riemann surface shown here on the slide of genus 2. In this case, the formula says that dimension of the moduli space of flat SU2 connections should be twice genus minus 1, which is 1, times dimension of the group, which is 3, so it should be of real dimension 6. And you bet, if you work harder and construct this moduli space explicitly, this is nothing but CP3. Nice, symplectic manifold, 
just like the one we would love to quantize. Also, its first homology, oh, sorry, second homology is one dimensional, which means that space of symplectic structures is one dimensional topologically. <coughs> now, as I mentioned, these are all good examples for quantization problem symplectic manifolds that are trying to be uh, trying out to be quantized and importance of this symplectic structure with which they are equipped was emphasized uh, probably in the most um, prominent way by uh, AT and Bot uh, who emphasized how important this, this is and has many applications in particular by writing this nice uh, formula on space M. Now I want to point out that the space that we get is compact and just like in the example of CP1, which we quantized in the beginning, uh, only for discrete set of symplectic structures the quantization problem will make sense and we should expect that we'll get an answer. So the result will be that this space constructed from solutions to flatness equations is quantizable only for integer values of the inverse Planck constant which is usually called the level in this literature. And in general, just like in the CP3 example I showed you a minute ago, for all these manifolds the second homology is one dimensional, so this level is simply single integer number. Otherwise you would have maybe several copies of integers or something like this. But luckily it's just one integer that uh, labels good symplectic structures. So K, group G, and the genus of the Riemann surface is what goes in the definition of the symplectic manifold M in this class of examples. So question then is what is the quantization of this space? What does it give us? For example, what does it give for Hilbert space H as a function of level, genus, and the group? And uh, what is the algebra of functions for, again, Riemann surfaces of different genus and bundles of, uh, with different structure group? We expect that since moduli space is compact, viewed as a phase space, uh, the corresponding quantization gives a finite dimensional Hilbert space. So it makes sense to ask about dimension of the Hilbert space as a function of all this input data. Also, following the semi-classical approximation, we expect that roughly if H bar is very small or level K, which is inverse of H bar is very big, then dimension of H can be approximated by the volume of the phase space. Again, I'm appealing to this uh, principle from the fathers of quantum mechanics that, roughly speaking, semi-classically, uh, per unit volume of the phase space, we should expect one state in the system. Well, in our example of genus 2 Riemann surface, volume of CP3 uh, with this normalized symplectic form is 1 6 K cubed, so we would expect that this is roughly the dimension of the space uh, when K is large, uh, that you get out of quantization. Well, this problem was solved by Eric Jorlinde, mathematical physicist who uh, got his PhD here in Utrecht, and uh, that's why I think the subject is very appropriate for Utrecht University hosting us. And he was actually very young when he did it, so just like many young members in the audience, he was in the graduate school when he wrote explicit formula for dimension of H as a function of level K, genus of the Riemann surface, and the group. So here I'm writing the formula when group is just SU2. And you see that the formula is already pretty complicated, and by looking at it first time, you wouldn't see that the answer is actually an integer. Because, see, you expect that if k, if the level is integer and the genus, which is certainly an integer, you would expect the dimension of the space should be an integer. And that's entirely non-obvious from uh, the first way of looking at this formula. However, if you write it for fixed genus, expand this trigonometric function and so on, what you get is a polynomial in k, so that's better that has a better chance to be an integer, but still coefficients of this polynomial expressing the dimension of the Hilbert space are rational numbers. Yet the polynomial has a nice structure. Of course the coefficients are such that for any integer value of k they conspire to give an integer. So that's good. 
That's, that's a fun part. So there is a lot of interesting structure in this formula, and that's exactly what's called Verlinde de formula. And by the way, notice that the leading term, of course, is exactly 1, 6 k cubed, which is our expected naive result from uh, principle that per unit volume of the phase space you get one state. So same is true for more general groups and Riemann surfaces with uh, any number of punctures or handles. You always get a polynomial in k. k is called the level. And you have all these kinds of coefficients, which I call AI, ranging from uh, 0 all the way to n. And they have a lot of interesting structure. Again, I could give a whole separate talk about number theory of these coefficients. I just want to point out that, again, in the case of SU2, which is uh, my prominent set of examples, um, good enough to illustrate many of the properties. And here is uh, proportional to genus. It's basically dimension of the group times um, genus minus one. That's what we computed a moment ago. Then the top coefficient here is a special value of the zeta function. The bottom coefficients also have nice structure. For example, the last one is always equal to one. That's a very simple and expected for a number of reasons. Um, basically, it says that if k is equal to zero, which is if symplectic form is equal to zero, you would expect that you should have one dimensional Hilbert space, and there are good reasons for it. So the next non trivial case uh, starts at value of i equals to 1, that's the coefficient a1, and it's basically a special value of the uh, beta function. And uh, then there are lots of interesting things in between. Even though the coefficients are expressed as function of the genus via this complicated transcendental functions and have pi's in there and so on, their special values are such that these are some rational uh, numbers. Now, is there some meaning to these numbers? Well, we already know that the leading coefficient is probably related to the volume of the symplectic manifold that we're trying to quantize. What about the others? It turns out that the answer is yes, that all of these coefficients have nice interpretation, in fact, in terms of classical geometry. So I want to emphasize that uh, this is a nice problem where we started with classical geometry of a symplectic manifold. We try to quantize it, we get something out of it, and then interpretation of this result of quantization is again expressed nicely in terms of completely classical geometry, but of a different type, not associated to the geometry of M itself in a direct way. It will be some other classical geometry that I called Y before. So, in fact, more explicitly, um, one point that I already mentioned, that leading coefficient here that dominates behavior of this polynomial when k is large or h bar is small, inverse of k, that's dominated by so-called semi-classical approximation and in particular the leading coefficient here is simply the volume of the symplectic manifold that we're trying to quantize and so on and it can be already expressed in terms of classical geometry associated to group G but the opposite limit for example when h bar is very large and its inverse is, is very small. That's the limit uh, describing the other coefficients on the other end of the polynomial. They also turn out to have a classical interpretation and also in terms of geometry, much like coefficients here, however, this classical geometry is associated to a different group. Everything is more or less the same, except the group G is replaced by some other group. And then, again, story becomes classical. This other group is called Langland's dual group. And Langland's discovered nice bijection or duality between many things associated with pairs of groups. So he was, uh, well, the way it's usually phrased as a relation between Goulart representations on one side and automorphic representations on the other side, but then it became a paradigm or whole program called Langland's program, which aims to relate many, many gadgets associated with pairs of groups. And the pairs are such that, for example, in the case of unitary groups, uh, not much is happening. 
the groups are the same on both sides, but more interesting things happen in Cartan types uh, B, C, and so on. For exceptional groups, for example, you have this map between E6 and E6 mod Z3, and so on. So the group LG, which we encountered on the previous slide, is exactly the Langlands dual group associated to G. So that's the statement, and I'll try to explain it later. So this is for the first class of examples with which I'll try to challenge quantization problem, namely these are moduli spaces of flat connections. Another class of examples is also based on groups in some way and is more directly related to representation theory. However, here I have to introduce a little bit more notations. Another key player today will be complexification of the group G. I'll denote it by GC. And let's pick some real form of this complexification, which may coincide with original one or maybe some other real form. For example, if our G is SU2, its complexification will be SL2C, and real forms are SU2 or um, SL2R. So that could be another option. Then, given this, data, it's very easy to construct other examples of symplectic manifolds simply by taking uh, adjoint or co-adjoint orbits. So one can take an element in the Lie algebra or its dual and act uh, with a real group GR on this element to produce either a joint or co-adjoint orbit. It's easy to verify that what you get is a symplectic manifold and you get a bunch of new examples which again crying out to be quantized and therefore should be nice testing grounds for, for approach to quantization, whichever approach you like. Since we talked about Langland's duality just a moment ago, let me mention one remark in passing since it's actually related to quantization. Um, and go a little bit uh, further to give you a few more details on what kind of orbits these are for general groups and uh, what they look like. There are different types of adjoint or co-adjoint orbits of different dimension and very roughly for Cartan type A, they're classified by partitions of N for UN. And the reason for this is that we can pick different elements, which I called X on the previous slide, of different Jordan type, and these are exactly, these the, the different Jordan types are exactly partitions of N. So that's how you get a uh, classification of either nilpotent orbits or there are sim semi-simple deformations by partitions of the rank. Now, in the present case of UN, the Langlands duality doesn't do very much, or if you want to express it in one way, you would probably say that it corresponds to transposition on these partitions. And starting with the partition of n, you can apply transposition to get another partition. So that would be uh, how Langlands duality acts on um, a joint or co-adjoint orbits of UN, and as I mentioned a moment ago, for uh, unitary groups, uh, their Langlands dual are the same, they are exactly identical. So that's why it's interesting to move on to other Cartan types and consider different groups. So then the, there is an analogous classification of orbits via partitions, but a more fundamental one based on jacobson morozov theorem is via maps from SU2 into G. So these are uh, labels of different orbits that you get, for example, for SON or SPN, for orthogonal and symplectic groups. You can still translate uh, these homomorphisms into uh, statements about partitions, but in this case you would find that orbits of SON, for example, are classified by partitions of N with some additional conditions. Usually in the literature they're called orthogonal partitions, or for symplectic group they would be symplectic partitions. And now, funny thing is that Langland's duality, for example, maps SPN to SON, uh, Cartan types B and C are exchanged via Langland's duality, and there is no guarantee that if you start with a symplectic partition on one side, via Langland's duality you'll actually get orthogonal partition by this transposition. And indeed what you find is that even if you try to write down different types of 
orbits, for example, here I illustrate how it goes for SP6 and SO7, which are Langlands dual, you'll find that there is no way to make a nice bijection. Even the number of types is different, so it won't match. And there are more delicate cases, which are uh, indicated here in red, which seem to spoil Langlands duality. So the reason I make this digression is because the problem of quantization actually helps to restore the bijection and uh, solve this apparent puzzle. Now, coming back to quantization and uh, why this is another good set of examples for quantization problem, of course, the real orbit, O sub R, which is another example of a symplectic manifold, is equipped with a Poisson structure or its inverse symplectic structure, which is nothing but the uh, custom kirillov sarai um, symplectic structure that can be explicitly written, for example, uh, via the structure constants of the group G. In fact, I want to remind you that we already discussed in the very beginning a baby example of SU2, and in this case the structure constants are exactly epsilon i, j, k, and that therefore this is exactly the kind of symplectic form that you would obtain in SU2 case. So the two sphere, which is the orbit of SU2, is exactly example of this simple example of this kind, where we have a large class of symplectic manifolds coming from um, real orbits of real groups. Now, the natural question is, what is their quantization supposed to be? It's supposed to produce some Hilbert space and algebra for which, which acts on this Hilbert space and so on and so forth. And in the present case, this is exactly the basic idea of the so-called orbit methods, which says that representations of the real group G, some real form of complex group that we discussed, can be constructed by quantizing <coughs> orbits, quadjoint orbits of GR. However, there have always been some puzzles with the orbit method, and I want to emphasize that puzzles are good, that uh, they teach us something about quantization. They could give us useful lessons uh, from which we should derive the direction for, for next step or for the progress. And in this case, there are two types of puzzles associated to the fact that there are perfectly good orbits, which are very nice symplectic manifolds waiting to be quantized, which have no corresponding representations, unitary representation. And conversely, there are perfectly good unitary representations of real groups, which don't seem to have corresponding orbits attached to them. Well, the second phenomenon is actually uh, very simple and familiar. Already in the basic case of SL2R, there are so-called complementary series representations which don't seem to have corresponding orbits. So that's one problem. The converse direction is a little bit more delicate that I mentioned. Here you have to go to a slightly more non-trivial example to see it. I guess the simplest example that I know is so-called minimal orbit, that is, symplectic manifold of the smallest possible dimension in Cartan type B. So if you choose a real form of SOPQ group, where P plus Q is odd in order to be in Cartan type B, then you'll find that the corresponding representation, representation that seems to correspond to this minimal orbit, exists if either P or Q is less than or equal to 3, and it does not exist otherwise. So the way you obtain this result is via going through complicated algebra pages and pages of calculations, and then you realize that uh, some commutators don't seem to close if uh, P and Q don't satisfy these conditions. So this is, again, a kind of delicate algebraic result which obviously cries out for better understanding and explanation. And this is just tip of an iceberg. If you go to higher rank you'll find many, many more such examples of orbits that don't seem to have a representation corresponding to them. So the solution to both problems can be obtained by going to replacing the classical orbits by their stringy analogs, what, what people call brains. And here I allude to physics terminology where brains are some certain submanifolds. Now they're also part of mathematics, and I'll, I'll describe them in a second in a more mathematical language. But they started their life in the subject of mirror symmetry, where 
as I said before, we are comparing symplectic geometry of one manifold on one side and algebraic geometry or complex geometry of a different manifold. So, in the case of symplectic manifold on so-called A side, the brains are Lagrangian submanifolds in the symplectic space. And, uh, well, recently people realized that one has to enlarge this class to include also quasitropic submanifolds. And in the case of complex geometry, good submanifolds, which are natural and would be expected, are holomorphic submanifolds. So this is the first and most basic approximation to what the brain means. Then it was realized by Maxim Kantsevich that Lagrangian submanifolds as well as holomorphic submanifolds are simple baby examples which have to be put into complexes and therefore assembled into derived categories which these days are called uh, Fukaya category and the derived category of coherent sheaves and this is considered to be proper home for Lagrangian submanifolds on symplectic side and holomorphic submanifolds on algebraic or complex side. So then the statement of mirror symmetry that there is some relation between two sides is expressed as equivalence of these two categories naturally attached to either symplectic geometry or complex geometry. Now let's revisit in this slide our problem of quantization. So the starting data which is again just very much as in mirror symmetry is the data of a symplectic manifold M and symplectic form omega to which one wants to associate the Hilbert space, the algebra and so on and so forth. So how would one, want, how would one construct this Hilbert space? One way to do it is to replace the original symplectic manifold by some other manifold Y, which is complexification of M. And then it turns out that in this complexification, in the bigger space, which is twice the dimension of the space of the symplectic space M that you want to quantize, there are two natural objects, objects in the Foucault category, associated to initial data. First of all, there is a real slice, the manifold M sitting as a submanifold here itself, and I'll tell you a little bit more about it in a second. And then there is yet another object, which I'll describe on the next slide. So then if you look at the Foucault category of this other space and consider the home between these two objects, both of which are canonically associated to the initial starting data, you get some space out of it. And I claim that that's exactly the space H that one wants in the quantization problem. And I'll apply this abstract sounding machinery to concrete examples of co-adjoint orbits as well as moduli spaces of flat connections and we'll see how all the delicate points that we encountered in these nice examples are circumvented or solved in the Foucault category uh, in this context. I have to say however that in practice if you want to do calculations, for example if you want to compute the Verlinde formula which should give you dimension of the Hilbert space H a result of quantization of the moduli space of flat connections, this Foucault category is not good home for doing such concrete calculations. It's difficult and even the definition of the Foucault category with the coisotropic objects included is still in progress. However, if you have a concrete description of this object, and I'll show you that in this case there are very concretely described, what you can do, you can do the following. You can apply mirror symmetry to this setup and transform the problem from symplectic geometry of this space Y to algebraic geometry of its mirror. And if you know exactly and precisely what the objects whose space of homomorphism you want to study, you can simply relate this calculation of the home on the symplectic side to calculation of the X groups on the mirror side. And now this becomes something very concrete, very doable, and uh, the computation of this X is a good exercise in uh, algebraic geometry class. Now, in physics, these two objects, which I call B prime and BCC, are particular objects in the Foucault category. They are associated to boundary conditions in the string world sheet, whose picture I draw here. One of the objects is Lagrangian brain or Lagrangian object, which is real slice. Uh, manifold M sitting as a real slice in its complexification. That's a middle dimensional object. And it's Lagrangian with respect to uh, one of the symplectic forms on Y, and 
This is a simple guy corresponding to reflecting boundary conditions from the wall sheet point of view. The other object is quasi-tropic, and its support is all of Y, so it sits on the entire complexification and carries an untrivial line bundle whose curvature is a real part of the holomorphic symplectic form that you naturally get by complexifying the little omega. So you use real part of this big omega to define quasitropic object, and then I claim that both of these fellows are good, nice objects in the Foucault category of the total space with respect to imaginary part of capital omega. So that's easy to check. For Lagrangian it's trivial, and for this one uh, it's, it's a simple calculation one can do. So then if you have these two objects, you can conserve various homes between them. So home, for example, from quasitropic to quasitropic guy gives you a big algebra, and that's exactly algebra that one expects to find by deformation quantization. And in the present case of examples that I showed to you coming from either co-adjoint orbits or moduli spaces, there is always nice complexification. So it's natural to consider this problem, and in fact it will be related to many problems that people working on mirror symmetry have already studied. So the spaces which we'll get uh, will be something that people saw in different contexts, and um, therefore the relation to other results will, won't be very surprising. For instance, if we start with real co-adjoint orbit, then complexification of it is very natural. There could be many, but one natural choice is just to complexify the real, group, uh, the real group, make it into GC, and correspondingly the real orbit into complex quadjoint orbit. So then, again, applying this machinery, what you find is that H is a representation of the real group, and the corresponding algebra is some quotient of the universal enveloping algebra. Same if you apply it to the other class of examples coming from Riemann surfaces and bundles on them, then here we have space which we want to quantize defined as space of G flat connections. So its natural complexification is just space of GC flat connections. Remember when we describe the moduli space very concretely in terms of matrices AI and BJ and so on, there are G values from the start. So all we have to do is to replace each entry of the matrix by its complex analog, by the corresponding complexification. So in this way, you get very concrete, nice description of the moduli space of flat GC connections, where the original space sits as a real slice, as a Lagrangian submanifold. Now, I'm not going to go into detail of how this construction works for each of these classes of examples. This has been done in various papers I mentioned. I just want to illustrate how it helps with the delicate points that we encountered along the way. For example, remember in the context of examples coming from representation theory, coming from co-joint orbits, there were some orbits which didn't have corresponding representations and vice versa, some representations which didn't have orbits. Now things are much better from the perspective of the A model, from the perspective of the Foucault category of the complexification. Where in the case of representations, they were attached to Lagrangian submanifolds, and even though there is no Lagrangian submanifold that corresponds to uh, complementary series representation, of course, there is actually an object in the Foucault category which does the job. So, in this way, if you work with the Foucault category of a complexification, instead of trying to quantize real orbits, you naturally recover complementary series representations as part of the same package. And this approach is closely related to uh, Bellins and Bernstein description of representations and work of David Vaughan and uh, Kashiwara and many others. Now, in the, the second problem that we saw was that sometimes you encounter representations, uh, sorry, orbits that don't seem to have corresponding representations. And the condition was very funny. It was, for example, in the case of SOPQ group, a uh, very special constraint on values of P and Q. Actually, this condition, which came out as a result of a very lengthy calculation, is something that people working on mirror symmetry know extremely well. In the context of Foucault category, 
An important role is played by so-called A infinity structure, which is based on various um, multiplication products, M1, M2, M3, and so on. And a good object in the Foucault category is such that the first product, usually called M1, vanishes. Otherwise, one has so-called anomaly or uh, the object of Lagrangian submanifold may be a good Lagrangian submanifold, but it wouldn't be good from the point of view of the Foucault category. And that could be expressed as a certain topological condition related to the second stiffel whitney class of the Lagrangian submanifold. And again, if you revisit the problem from the viewpoint of the Foucault category of the bigger space, uh, of twice big dimension and complexification of M, then some of the Lagrangian submanifolds may not be good objects from the viewpoint of Foucault category. And again, practitioners of mirror symmetry know this condition extremely well. And these are exactly the cases, for example, if you apply it to this uh, minimal orbit of SOPQ, you quickly recover exactly the same constraint on values of P and Q as we get from algebra. Now, coming back to another class of examples, coming from moduli spaces of flat connections, in conclusion, let me tell you what this viewpoint has to offer to their quantization. Here, we were studying quantization of modular flat connections of the group for the group G and the Riemann surface C. Now, its complexification, as I mentioned a moment ago, is naturally a moduli space of flat GC connections, complexified connections on the Riemann surface. However, it's convenient to look at this complexification, the bigger space, not just as a moduli space of flat GC connections, but notice that it's actually a hyperkeller manifold, which happens in one of its complex structures to coincide with the moduli space of flat complexified connections. So instead, to emphasize this, I'm going to describe complexified space Y, the bigger space, as the moduli space of Higgs bundles studied by Hitchin and therefore often referred as the Hitchin moduli space associated to group G and Riemann surface. In fact, this hyperkeller structure in this case is extremely useful and it showed up in many, many applications, in particular in the work on geometric Langlands, which is exactly the basis of the statement I mentioned a while ago about interpretation of the coefficients in the Verlinde formula. So from the viewpoint of hyperkeller structure, the uh, real slice, the moduli space of G connections, is embedded in this moduli space of Higgs bundles in a very nice way. Not only it's Lagrangian with respect to one of the symplectic forms, which is A brain that we called it before, it also is compatible with other complex and symplectic structures. Namely, it's also Lagrangian from the viewpoint of one other complex symplectic form, and it's actually holomorphic in one of the complex structures usually called I. So it's actually a holomorphic Lagrangian submanifold, or what physicists sometimes call BAA brain, to emphasize that it's a good B brain, or holomorphic object, in one complex structure, and good A brain, or Lagrangian object, uh, in other symplectic structures. So coisotropic uh, brain BCC, defined by conditions I mentioned earlier, also happens to be of the same type, uh, BAA. Um, namely holomorphic and complex structure I and symplectic for omega j, omega k on this moduli space of Higgs bundles. Now, in this case, one has very concrete and explicit description of all of these fellows, these two objects in the Foucault category of Y, namely one is Lagrangian and the other is coisotropic, and one can write exactly what they are. So the natural question is, okay, in order to do calculation, for example, if you want to compute the Hilbert space H, or just get its dimension, which should be the Berlin the formula, uh, it's easy now to take the mirror, to go to the mirror side. And what's nice about this moduli spaces of Higgs bundles is that each one has a mirror such that it's also a moduli space of Higgs bundles but associated with a different group, exactly this Langlands dual group, LG. So the operation of mirror symmetry in this class of examples it allows you to go from Foucault category of Y to category of coherent sheaves on moduli space of Higgs bundles but for the Langlands dual group. And both of these fellows, which objects whose morphisms we want to compute, originally start as objects of type BAA, 
And then it turns out that mirror symmetry, it's easy to work out on general grounds, should turn them to objects of type BBB. In other words, they should be nice holomorphic objects with respect to all complex structures of the mirror, which I call Y tilde here. Such objects which are holomorphic in all complex structures are called hyperholomorphic sheaves or bundles, for example, if you work with bundles or sheaves, or submanifolds. In fact, let's think about just manifolds for a second, which could be viewed as a support of a certain sheaf. There are very few submanifolds in a space, which is hypercalar, such that the submanifold is holomorphic with respect to any complex structure you pick. Obviously, the whole space itself is an example. It's holomorphic with respect to any complex structure. Also, a point in a manifold happens to be holomorphic in, with respect to any uh, complex structure. But in general, there are very few examples beside this one. So besides the point or the total space, which are the trivial examples, it's very hard to construct something which will be hyperholomorphic. It's very non-trivial, and it turns out that this fellow's uh, mirror of B tilde uh, prime and B tilde CC, the mirrors of the original ones, are exactly hyperholomorphic objects. One of them is generalization of the first trivial example I showed you, namely a point. It happens to be the mirror of the Lagrangian, and the reason for this is that original moduli space of G connections is component of a nilpotent cone, uh, one of the degenerate fibers in the Hitchin moduli space for the group G, and under mirror symmetry it's transform transformed to a point or skyscraper shift supported at a point on the mirror variety. Likewise, the second object via mirror symmetry is transformed again to something hyperholomorphic, and it's actually of the other kind. It's supported on the entire space, and uh, that's why it can be hyperholomorphic, but it's actually a sheaf of generally reasonably high rank. So the rank is equal to volume of uh, fiber, which I'll explain in the next and the last slide. So to think about this mirror symmetry, it's very convenient to represent um, Hitchin moduli space, moduli space of Higgs bundles, as a vibration by abelian varieties. This is exactly the viewpoint that Nigel Hitchin had when he studied these spaces and uh, associated them or called them completely integrable systems, algebraic completely integrable systems, because by definition these are the ones which have a vibration over a fine space by generic fibers which are abelian varieties and this is compatible with the viewpoint of mirror symmetry by Strominger, Yao and Zaslav, these three gentlemen here, who said that in general mirror symmetry between symplectic manifold Y and complex or algebraic manifold Y tilde should be such that it is nothing but Fourier Mukai transform fiber wise on every fiber of uh, vibration over the same base. So that's how, using this picture, you can quickly deduce that the rank of this mirror of the coisotropic object, which in many other applications is very hard to find, is actually equal to the volume of the fiber of the original vibration. So that's just a simple calculation that you can obtain from this um, viewpoint on the moduli space of Higgs bundles. So this is... Uh, what goes in the calculation of Verlin the formula via mirror symmetry, and that's how you can reproduce the coefficients, uh, some of them I showed you before, via geometry of moduli space of Higgs bundles for the Langlands dual group um, if you look at different asymptotic expansion. So this is all I wanted to say. I just want to conclude again with some fun part and uh, question um, what makes mathematics problem fun for you, so there are many ways to look at this question and uh, think about it, so this is one way. And uh, my personally favorite way is the one given by Sir Michael when he was asked exactly the same question in his interview on math, physics, and fun. He said that the main things that interest him is interconnection between different areas and the fact that the same problem can be looked at from several different viewpoints. So he says that it's the bridges and interactions that interest me the most. So I hope in this talk I showed you several bridges and connections between 
various different areas, including representation theory, symplectic geometry, but most notably connection to mirror symmetry. Thank you.